Can you see me now? No. I can still see you. Everything seems okay on my... Yeah, I can hear you well, so you're here. Okay. Up Weird. there you are, I found you. Okay, cool. Hey. How are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, very good. I'm really busy with this uh, uh, architecture TV uh, production right now. I but see it's... some hands there. So you're, yeah. you're, you're I'm, gonna, I'm gonna introduce you to, this is Kenara. Hi, how's it going? He's a filmmaker. He's like a one man, uh, a one, one man, man show. TV. Yeah, sound cool. and editing and filming and everything. He's a super skilled guy. He he's my cousin from Kautokano. If my if our internet was better, I would do it from outside because it's really nice outside today. Oh like, yeah, I know. That's our new fence. It's called um, it's called a coyote fence. Hi, and uh, welcome to Post-Capitalist Architecture TV, a TV series in three parts that I'm producing with Ken Bongo uh, about my research on uh, architecture and design in indigenous perspectives. Uh, my art show in Bergen for Festbilden was supposed to open uh, now this week, but unfortunately, due to pandemic reasons, it's postponed until September. So this is a little small improvised TV series that um, tries to give a little bit of an insight into the research and the discourse and the ongoing uh, things I got going on for, for the production of the art show in Bergen. Um, tonight we will be screening the first of the three episodes which will be dealing with um, the material culture of the north, resource economy and vernacular architecture. Candice Hopkins is a curator, uh, Canadian from Yukon, and uh, she's been a big inspiration and a curator that I've been in touch with for quite some years already. Um, we did a large project together three years ago in Documenta, and um, since then we've also stayed quite a bit in touch, uh, discussing and talking um, uh, a lot about contemporary art and indigenous identity. I picked up the one of the, my favorite texts from you, which is the, the, the creative misuse of everyday objects. And, um, and there's something uh, in, there's, a, there's a, some lines in that, in that text that I really like. And, and one of them is where you sort of, where you describe, where you sort of dive into the, the, the vernacular architecture uh, and, you, and you describe this sort of creative misuse as some kind of an aesthetical resistance. Uh, and I was like hoping that uh, to, to direct the question to you that would uh, make you elaborate a little bit about, about that concept, if you still have mm. it. Yeah, no, I'm still, still something that I'm thinking about. Um, actually, you never saw maybe the new essay that I wrote on Brian, but I wrote a photo essay and we included a lot of photographs that you would be intrigued with too. It's actually been two decades now that I've been getting to know him. But then I realized that what he was doing, he was doing this kind of like, uh, I don't know, studies, let's say like little sculptures. He said he would stack things when he was back home on reserve because everyone would stack things on their big freezers, right? Where you keep all your moose meat. And he was interested to know who would recognize that as sculpture and who would recognize it just as something you need to move aside to get to your meat. And uh, then all these kind of configurations, um, very similar to the way that you're, you're interested in these kind of like uh, design solutions where people use everything on hand, like a common thing up there is you'll build a, build a fence out of um, old car doors, for example. You do that in the Navajo uh, res too. Um, and to me, what's so brilliant about that is you immediately, you're not seeing the intended use of that material, but you're thinking about its possible uses in the future. So in some ways, it's an incredible, it's actually an aesthetic of incredible freedom in my mind, because 
because you're not confined by what someone else thought was 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 um, the protocols around that that thing. You you instead just think, you know, what is my necessity right now? What is around me? What will work well? And then you invent something. So, and it, I think what's also interesting about it as well is that. Um, other people look to it, yeah, but I don't think that the people who are often making these solutions see themselves necessarily as architects or, or artists. I think that this is an invention that comes out of a very local kind of context. Um, but what's what's interesting to me too is I saw this one picture and this is kind of moving away from Brian's region or where I'm from in, in northeastern British Columbia to Navajo res, there was this guy who was, was one of the teachers at the Institute of American Indian Arts in the 60s. So he was going out to the res and just taking photographs of things. And one of my favorite photographs of his was this photograph of this um, car door fence. But someone had taken it upon themselves to alternate the colors between red and blue. So there was a real consideration there to use the car paint so that you would know you'd make a pleasing image as well as keeping your sheep in. Because the perfect thing about the corridors is they have a perfect height that a sheep can't jump over it or climb it like a goat would, right? Um, and they're also very solid, they're impermeable, so they also can't push them over. Today, coffee is ready. Today, um, Elin Haugdal is coming. Uh, she is an art historian from the University of Tromsø here in town um, that I've been, well, on and off discussing and collaborating with, uh, well, the last seven, eight years. Um, and she's a big inspiration and discussion partner for me. And uh, she's done a lot of research and writing on Northern architecture. I was uh, actually first. I was I was going to refer to this text, uh, which is called Conversion. It's a project I did with Celia Figenskau Torison, uh, some another Sami artist and designer, and uh, it's been a really important project for both of us, I think. And uh, it's basically about this sort of makeshift, uh, self-invented uh, designs of the North, and especially. From our point of view, we were interested in sort of the Sami areas and how the Sami culture were sort of um, carrying this way of building. It's like an attitude, I think. That's a bit why we called it the Indigenuity Project in English. Indigenuity being some kind of a, a mixture between in, in ingenuity and, and indigenous or indigeneity, indigenous identity. So um, for that project, you wrote the text conversion where you are talking a little bit about uh, different forms of uh, designing. Uh, and I was wondering if you could just briefly uh, sum up some of the thoughts you had. I had worked on the Sami parliament before I wrote uh, this. And, um, and I saw the other public buildings. It's all about icon uh, iconic architecture, we call them. Um, or as I tried to figure out in this text about the analogical design principles maybe we could call it when the architects come to the north to this to Sapme and um, uh, looks in the culture and the historical culture the vernacular architecture to find some visual clues signs to use in in their new buildings so that was uh, my background before writing this um, and then i tried to sort out maybe four design principles in, um, in the north or in everywhere. It's, I think it's uh, possible to transfer this to other places than just Satme. Um, you have the, tip, the typological design principle, like when you're building the turf hut, you learn these principles. You, you take what you have with materials, construction principles you learn, um, and then you re do the same thing 
uh, follow a type, typological design principle. Um, and then you have some, as we in art history are very concerned with, the geometrical design principle, when you, you have uh, uh, geometrical forms, ideal forms, um, which is your uh, uh, starting point for designing architecture. As I saw your project, your ph photos from uh, different um, smart solutions in, uh, in the northern area, um, I think this pragmatic design principle is what strikes me most as interesting and as um, exemplary maybe for architecture today. So these four, analogical, typological, uh, iconic or geometrical, and then pragmatic design principle. Uh, and I, I think it's so interesting to think about that this uh, this differentiation between the vernacular and and the, the architect way of designing and uh, do you have any thoughts on on uh, on how ver vernacularity or the vernacular or these kind of concepts could be used in in architecture in a more contemporary way you know one of the things that I was thinking of like what are what holds together for example um, northwest coast architecture Navajo architecture, which really means the spaces that you inhabit. You live in them, you build them for animals, you build them for ceremony, right? Um, and and they, they have distinct purposes. But I also think that the important thing about these vernacular architectural spaces, and certainly the ones that I've seen in your area as well, is they also inhabit a belief system. So I think it's a question of whether it makes sense to transpose those. What does it make sense? What does it mean to transpose a kind of belief system that's coming from a very um, land-centered environment or land and water-centered environment um, to something else? And I think that that's where you kind of get almost like um, a bit of an alienation. Like you are, you've talked yourself about this um, kind of phenomena of the giant lavu, right? That started happening uh, when there was a kind of Sami aesthetic that was applied to these new architectural spaces back in uh, Satmi, right? Um, so I think that kind of alienation happens at first, but then I wonder what comes next. Hmm. Did you ever make this really, uh, this is so interesting what you're bringing up now. And it's actually a, it's actually a building that uh, we've been to film already um, and it's a building that's used as an artist residency now it was conceived and designed by Nils Arslak Valkepe who you yeah. also worked with in uh, Documenta a little bit and the building is called Lassagami did you did you ever go there no but I've seen pictures and I and I would love to go there because because it's also the way I understand it, it's a kind of open space, it's a round open space and it's very well situated in the land and everything he did, as far as I understand, it was actually Tanya Yor who, who revealed this to me that from what she learned about his practice that I've shared with everyone because I think it's so brilliant is that you also need to do things in the rhythm of the seasons. So he would make the bigger things in the summer when you had more light, when everything was growing. And then in the winter, when things tend to go a bit more dormant, he, start, he started to work inside and work on smaller things. It's a very sort of conscious attempt from his side to, to actually to make a type of architecture that, that, that uh, embodies this kind of mythology and these belief systems that he mm -hmm. sort of traced back you know, to ancient times, like pre-Christian time period in Sami culture. And mm -hmm. uh, the way the building shaped with uh, the circular sort of plan, with a sort of vertical fireplace in the middle, the way it's situated, like you say, on the land, uh, just like really, really close to the, this beautiful beach on the very, very edge of his family's reindeer herding district, which represents the end of a line in a way for him that, and the idea of the idea of home, <clears throat> mm -hmm. the border of his own home. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's really an interesting piece of architecture that really contains all this, this kind of yeah, belief systems, like you say. Hello, Ellen. Hi, Yes, I had to take a break. <laughs> this place called Evobobata, um, or Shebotten. Um, it's an, a 
very old uh, village which used to be a marketplace and we were very close to the Finnish border so there's a population of uh, Finnish Norwegian Kven here and Samis traditionally and also Norwegian and um, in the end of the village here uh, Lassagami lays the old house from uh, Nils Arslak Velkipe, which was uh, designed by him and Aino Jokinen in the late 90s and it was uh, I think it was finished 2001 if I remember correctly and uh, Ailoash lived there Ailoash Nils Arslak Velkipe uh, he lived there a few years before he passed away and uh, after his uh, passing, he left the building as a residency for um, indigenous artists and researchers working with, well, topics related to his art practice, which is, uh, uh, yeah, investigating indigenous and Sami culture and art and history. The second time I arrived here, for some reason, I really noticed uh, the, what I could almost call like a acoustic architecture that you could, there's a lot of like resonant material in the wood and then suddenly someone has put this little, this little shell here. And so one evening I was like dancing around listening to music. I just started like touching everything. We took a drive out to Lossagami to visit Elin Mar Øyen Wister. Elin is a sound artist uh, living at Røst. We had a chat about her thoughts on the relationship between sound and architecture. So we just start to experiment like three years ago I read an article by a colleague in England that was describing um, a work by Ailo Hersh, Nils Arslak Valkipe, called uh, Guasa Dusha. I'm sure it's a better pronunciation than my very basic Sami, but uh, it's also called the, in English the Bird Symphony. And for you who don't know me, I have been doing, I have a background in music and sound since I was a child, and then I have been working with radio and DJing and organizing events and in addition to that I'm an artist and I work a lot with field recordings. So when I found this masterpiece uh, that describes uh, how his family moved in the land with uh, reindeer herds in a way from sort of spring to autumn and back, I was amazed and it was the most beautiful thing I ever heard and I thought how come no one told me about this when I have been making my own bird symphony. And of course that made me think about uh, canons and how we, which voices are heard in storytelling and how important it is to both decolonize canons but also explode them and create new ones based on other methodologies. And then it's also important to come here because um, I am trying to sort of, it's a kind of sound archaeology or uh, in the way that I'm trying to think of what he heard and um, I can't imagine what he heard because he grew up in a specific way and in a, his cultural context and also in like a Sami aesthetic surrounding so of course his way of experiencing nature was unique to his experience but I can uh, listen to since I've been spending most of my life very actively listening I'm a listen, very lis I'm a listener so I am very curious here, for instance, just how did he listen inside this house? Because I feel this is also like his poetry is very, is, is a very listening poetry. He's, 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 he's always very present in nature. And so he's a listener, he's a deep listener, and he is always very aware of all sensory inputs. And when you're in this house, there is really this kind of way of the way the house is built. So the are, are architecture yes. really uh, affects how you can listen so it's probably like being in a level where the sound comes in through the walls 
So I love sleeping with the windows open because I hear the waves and the bird sounds. And um, often here, uh, depending on where the wind blows, you can really see. Uh, okay, now it's really noisy. The, it's like being outside. The ocean is inside the house. So and today now when the when the tide is high, you can really feel it's like it's like coming into the house. And then the house itself is made of wood, and wood is very resonant material, and it also gives a really good uh, sound um, isolation. So it's a good place to work with singing, talking. For instance, the shower downstairs is excellent for recording vocals <laughs> if you're singing. But in here, you know, uh, he has installed this amazing uh, multi-surround system. So if you put on an album here, you can hear it in all the rooms except the kitchen. And you can actually hear it in the basement in the sauna. Mm. So I mean, this is a man who was a very deep listener and how, how the sound is incorporated into the house, both like the external sound, he lets it seep through, you know, the big windows also let sound in. Mm. And uh, the way it's placed, you know, uh, I can hear birds, I can hear the wind, you know, I can hear everything. I mean, it's incredibly, it's like uh, something extremely basic in the sense that it comes from our deepest root. So when you, uh, in our all common past, we obviously lived much closer in nature. And for his, for his part, his family, you know, his mother, uh, you know, his close family was literally born in a, born outside, you know, not outside, but in a, architectural structure that lets you hear nature uh, as you, almost if you were outside. So this closeness to sound environments is something that uh, calms us still. That's why it's really nice, like I said earlier, to keep the window open and lie and listen to waves. And these are these cyclic rhythmical sounds that our body actually has a relationship to. And then uh, when we grow up in the Western world, and um, um, and these kind of uh, capitalistic and colonistic education systems, we are not in touch with what our bodies are actually communicating with, you know, the tide, actually for women, the tide affects our uh, menstrual cycles, but of course it also affects the amount of water we have in our bodies and how much water there is in plants. So. When you start to talk about uh, cycles and sounds of nature, we are, we are it. We just sort of, uh, some part of this world have decided that we shouldn't be, and they have seemed to be ruling the world right now, and we have to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ellie. Can it's we not... do a radio program with your van in yeah. the future, like a mobile hey. radio? For sure. Yes. <laughs> so it's not completely. Yeah, yeah. Finished, but we have the oh, this the reindeer yes. session. This fireplace goes yes. in the middle. Yes. We have a pipe goes through oh, here. Oh yeah. We lighted it uh, yesterday. That's so cool. How yeah. did it work? Fantastic. Right. Everything just stopped when we put the fire on. We were just like, okay. So we chilled out for two hours. Took a glass of red wine. Enjoyed oh, the vibe. This is so we have a generator. So we're totally free yeah. to run. Kenara has a mobile phone with oh, a lot of three uh, four G unlimited mm. so we can basically do that sort of tv talk show thing from anywhere <laughs> it's 
doing this. Yeah. We were we're not gonna do it with you because you are in the yeah, most yeah. amazing house already. So we'll sort of use that as a backdrop. But... TV. <laughs> well, I was thinking that the vernacular, it's not it's not just a mode of building. It is that, just as you described it, it's a belief system sort of manifest in the building. And what happens when you lose that? And how do you bring it back? For example, like some people, of course, it's always it's always there. But that's why I think when I first started writing about architecture, I was interested in these buildings that were, as I understood them, to be kind of ruptures in the grid, right? In the kind of colonial grid, because when you start to order land, when you start to to understand land as commodity, um, then you, it enables people to live in these kind of grid like grid like areas, and then and then with that comes the very manifestation that actually this land is mine. So we're no longer custodians. We're no longer building sort of in relation to you know the curves of the river or the or you know a little ravine, but instead we sort of want to. To sort of dominate and so that's how i started but then i started thinking more and more about these kind of places of in between that were also other forms of rupture so that's why i was describing the metis road allowance houses earlier because these were people who had to make their homes wherever they could and they had to make their homes with that idea that they might be temporary. So what kind of building do you do when you know that it'll be temporary? Or like you, I know that this happened in Sapmi a lot as well, where, you know, someone won't value it because they won't see it necessarily as a house. Um, they'll just see it as a, as a temporary shelter, but that temporary shelter might have been occupied for hundreds of years. But I think I think it's important in today's society when when everything is so um, uh, smooth, streamlined, uh, commercialized, <laughs> um, and we are concerned with reuse of materials, and maybe we also should be concerned about how we slow the process of making and. Um, let the doers in, but that is hard to to confer to to public buildings. So here, I think it's um, an interesting conflict how to to adapt this to uh, to public buildings and to to public um, places to to uh, uh, the monuments <laughs> of today. So, um, mm -hmm. is there any examples that you have looked into or that you find? that are somehow trying to do that or that have succeeded in a way or another? Yeah. Um, we have a small building, a pavilion at our university called Erdna, for instance, uh, where uh, the doyer, Jon Ole Andersen, who has worked together with the artist Ivi York for many years, they built the, the interior of uh, the Samer Museum in Karasjok, and at the university, um, Jon Ole Andersen, he uh, was, um, uh, working to um, find the right materials, where to pick up the stones for the for the fireplace, where to uh, to, to find the timbers for the construction, and uh, a lot of, of uh, small material details, uh, which he had his hand on, <laughs> and uh, which took made the process building this Sami pavilion took a long time because he had to do it in uh, um, a way that was uh, in um, correspondence with the Sami way of building. Your fire oh my god it looks so nice it's thank brilliant. you thanks for helping yeah here's the here's the halibut stomach screen 
Oh my God, look at that. Wow. <laughs> That's your it's working. Yeah, it's, it's still not finished. I have to, I have to, have to uh, work a little bit harder, but uh, well, it's... I think this might be also um, one of the characteristics of vernacular architecture is to have multiple projects always yeah. on the go and none of them are finished. Exactly. Yes, I agree. That's poetry. Keep things alive. You should never finish anything. Yeah. 